Well, hi, I'm Eva Kwong. Um, I'm an artist. I live here in Ohio, and I am the wife to the late Kirk Mangus. We met at um, undergraduates uh, in the same freshman class at Rhode Island School of Design in 1971. Yes, he grew up in Sharon, Pennsylvania. His parents were both artists. Uh, his mother taught at, his mother was actually his high school art teacher. So he grew up in an artistic household. They always, he was an only child. They always involved him in art projects. Uh, he said they were always available, like he had clay on the kitchen counter uh, that his father would bring home from school that he would that he could make anything he wanted, which I think when he was little, uh, he would make uh, animals and battle scenes because he was so interested in Greek and Roman culture. Uh, he always had like paper, pencil, uh, pen, watercolors. His mother did a lot of watercolors, so she taught him to do watercolors. He said, you know, they took him to see art shows and museums. Well, I don't think he had a choice. <laughs> I think his parents just expected him to be. And I think he was always interested because um, he just had always um, made projects, you know, as far as he can remember. He was always drawing or he was making things out of clay. Um, and his parents, of course, also encouraged him. Um, so I don't think, you know, he thought about doing too many other things. Uh, yes. Well, many things, you know, he read a lot, you know, he said being an only child, you know, he read a lot. And, and also that's why he had lots of free time to do lots of drawings all the time. I think, you know, experience is cumulative. So through his reading, his interest in Greek and Roman culture, when he was in elementary school, for example, that, you know, he of course looked up all the Greek pottery. And then of course, later on in life, it led to other cultures that he was interested in. Um, and it led to a study of art history. Um, he was interested in comics because that was something like he can walk down the couple blocks of the street corner and buy a comic when he was a kid. Um, he was interested in a lot of the folk art. Um, in We had a great art history department at Rhode Island School of Design. So, you know, we were introduced to a broad range from prehistoric to contemporary work. So, that gave us, I think, a really great foundation to a broad um, spectrum of artwork and cultures. Um, some things besides, some things he was also very interested in, like Art Brut, Du Buffet, Picasso, uh, the color field painters, abstract expressionists, the German expressionists, um, a lot of the Mayan artwork and a lot of uh, like Japanese prints and traditional Chinese and Korean and Japanese ink paintings. Well, he, through his life, through his, you know, decades of art making, uh, he evolved his style. He, I don't think people usually uh, decide on a style before they start. You know, I think that, evolves over the years as you work. And he started out doing very precise kind of pencil drawings and that he would build up all these little marks and that's from like looking at Renaissance drawings. And then he started uh, putting you know images on his pottery. So he started painting. So it went from pencil to a brush. So he started painting and that led him to a study of ink paintings and brush paintings. Well, he became interested in wood firing in the mid-70s. Mid he took an uh, earth, air, fire, water workshop in Grass Valley, California with uh, Remus Viscurda and Dick Hotchkiss, and he was there three summers uh, for working with them. And I spent one summer there. Um, we learned to dig clay from nearby, and we, need, we learned to process uh, process the natural materials, both for clay and for glazes. And um, 
make bricks, make kilns, build kilns and fire them. And then in 1980, we moved back to Pennsylvania and we built our own wood kiln. That was a kind of continued to be a lifelong influence on him, a lifelong interest. He always went around everywhere we went, whenever we travel, whenever we drive across country, we always stop in places that we think that might have clay and we would dig it up and put in the back of the car or back of the truck and bring it home and experiment with it. And he continued the whole time while he was teaching here in Kent, Ohio as well. Um, well, he loved teaching here. He started here in 19, the fall of 1985 until uh, he died suddenly of a brain aneurysm in 2013. Um, he loved the community of his students. You know, it was really quite wonderful because the ceramics lab, we had our own building. So in many ways, we sort of have our own world in there within uh, that building. And um, he would oftentimes involve some of his students to go with him to go dig clay or they would find clay and bring it in and to show him to experiment with. But he always felt that each clay has its own characteristics and that because of the composition of the clay, much like wine, that it reflects um, the geological history of the area. So it has different colors, different kind of grain size, um, and it fires differently, and it behaves, it even handles differently. But with natural clays, each one is different and unique. Well, he had, uh, he's always done drawings, and he oftentimes have, sometimes he's had shows of them. And in 1995, there was a show called Radical Ink at Spaces in Cleveland. So he designed the poster for them, and he also was invited to do a wall for them. And then that led to another, um, in 1998, he was invited by Bill Tortolot to participate in a show called Tales of Anxiety, Prophecy, and Reclamation. And I think that he invited several artists to paint directly on the wall at the museum. So this is at the South Bend Regional Art Museum in South Bend, Indiana. So Kirk was there for a whole week, and I think it's um, maybe 100 feet. I'm not exactly sure. And so that was his largest um, painting drawing at that time. And also in 2001, he was in Penavagis in Lithuania. He did large drawings there that he exhibited at the city hall. And so in that, so he's done several. And then in, in 2005, he was invited to be in the new master drawings organized by the Akron Art Museum in Akron. And because the museum was doing a renovation at that time, um, the show happened at, was presented at Summit Art Space. And they asked him, in addition to doing, to uh, showing his ink paintings and watercolors, um, to also show, to do a wall. And that is the wall um, titled Some Kind of Fashion that he painted directly on the wall. And so I think because of that, that led to the 2006 mural at the Summit Art Space, I think because they saw the wall painting there, they thought maybe it's a good idea to do the big wall in the parking lot. And it's a 225 feet long wall. And they had um, wrote grant, several grants for it. The lead grant was the National Endowment for the Arts. It's called Challenge America, Reaching Every Community Grant. And that was also uh, donations from the grants from the city of Akron, the Summer Youth Employment for Success, and Sharon Williams, and also other private donors. And Kirk was a National Endowment for the Art Artists in 1982. Two. So I think that was kind of all that one led to another. It was all kind of all tied together. It, so it's a big long space. So I, first I think he was a little stumped, you know, because it was 225 feet long, you know. So I think that sort of made him think about like a thinking like a scroll, you know, a Chinese ink painting scroll where it's sort of 
continue to evolve from one side to another. He wanted to, you know, include a lot of people. You know, one, he had, he was asked to work with students from many of the local schools and students he did not meet until they came to work with him. So he had to kind of design something that he could do that he could also have his um, helpers, his assistants, his school, uh, high school and middle school assistants do as well. So he started thinking about people, you know, how America is sort of the melting pot of, you know, many cultures. And in his travels, he realized, well, the world is quite big and we're all interconnected. And he, you know, and I think being in a minority in many of those countries, I think made him kind of rethink his place in the universe. And so he wanted to talk about the ethnic background or the cultural background that many of our citizens, many of people in our community come from. And he got the title, I think, first. It's called Kings and Queens. And he thought about, I asked him, like, why Kings and Queens? He said, well, Kings and Queens in the way sort of refers to that we can be the king and queen of our own destiny. We're in charge of our own life. Each individual is in charge of their own lives. So he decided to make as many figures as he can fit in. In, into the design because he um, incorporated some of the people that were part of the project on the in the mural. Well, it's not unlike much other work that he's done. He's always been interested in people. He's always like observing, watching, and drawing people. He does not work from photograph. He likes to work from memory. So he'll talk to you or he'll look at you and then he'll go back to his studio or his office or at home and he'll draw you or draw draw you in the sketchbook. So a lot of his students appear in his artwork, a lot of his friends appear in his artwork, and certainly his whole family is always in his artwork. Well, um, the mural, I think, documents Akron. It's a diverse community uh, that is made out of people coming from Italy, Nepal, Thailand, Ethiopia, Somalia, a broad range of cultures that have come through uh, Akron. So he wanted to kind of include some of that. So that's represented by the different kind of hair colors or facial features or clothes that they wear. But, you know, he wanted to, in many ways, um, document the past, past you know, meaning the cultures that people have brought to this area, you know, whether they're from Lithuania or Ukraine. In, at the present, these are all people that he knew that are living here. And hopefully in the, it would continue to have meaning in the future because, for example, we hope that all the people that participated in the painting, all the students that participated in painting of the mural would bring their own family when they get become adults, bring their own children and maybe grandchildren in the future to come see the mural. And their names are also signed on the bottom of the mural. It allows a lot of people to relate to it. And I think he wants it to be inclusive that people can relate, oh, this reminds me of my grandpa, or this reminds me of my Aunt Mary, you know, or this reminds me of so-and-so, uh, that people will relate to and connect to it. Oh, I've got a nose like that, you know, or I've got a hairdo like that. Oh. Well, at first, Kirk wasn't so sure how it was going to go because he had never met his student helpers before until the day they show up. And there were many groups and they did not come on the same day. <laughs> and not the same people showed up all the time either. So I remember the first day he came back from um, painting and I asked him, how did it go? He said, oh, well, it's great. He said, oh, they're so fast. I said, what do you mean? He thought it was gonna take them like two days to do the sky. Well, they did it in like in two hours. And they, then they asked, like, oh, okay, what next? You know, so he realized he has to work a lot.
faster. They were faster than he thought, you know, because they just went, do, 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 you know. Mostly he, uh, he drew the figures, what he wanted the figures to look like and where they would be and place them in relationship to each other. And mostly he asked his students to uh, paint in like the designs for the clothing, maybe the hats, you know, to add in details. Um, but he sort of oversaw what um, he did all the, the, head, the figures, the heads, so there would be a consistency to it. So he would... um, there's a call out for Faces of Akron to add additional um, paintings to it. They're not adding to the mural itself, but it's a continuation of the idea. So we're hoping to be able to continue this in the future you know, maybe have a yearly uh, addition to it. The wall is finite, but maybe we can find other walls in Akron, or it could be, um, I know this year is small paintings, so maybe we have a, can have a collection of these paintings that could be part of the community that can maybe belong to the art collection of Akron Art Museum or the Akron Public Library that could be uh, shown in the Akron area. So this would take it into the future as well.